good back then, and I can just roll it out. I can work one hour this week, and it'll be all good, you know? Um, but that's not, that's not what I did, um, because I really felt like the Lord laid this on us um, for the congregation as I was praying. Uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. And we're going to follow the flight of Israel through the wilderness. Israel, as you know, was brought out of, the, out of uh, slavery in Egypt. The Lord drew them out of the iron furnace, as the scriptures say. He delivered them through plagues, through displaying his power. He brought them through the Red Sea, parting it miraculously. The hosts of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, were swallowed up by the sea when they tried to pursue Israel. They were brought out into the wilderness. They were delivered. They belonged to God. There was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The Lord's presence was among them. They knew that they belonged to him, bought by blood, redeemed from slavery. And then they got hungry. They got thirsty. God fed them miraculously with manna from heaven. Little droplets that looked like coriander seed tasted like Krispy Kreme donuts, if that helps you. Um, And they were fed by that. They could bake it into things. If they collected twice as much on Friday, it would last to Saturday. But if they tried to store up too much, it would breed worms and maggots and it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be there the next day. But God fed them out of the sky. That's weird. Do you believe God can do that? <laughs> do you believe in a real God? They had to believe in that. They had to believe that God would meet all their needs because they were in the wilderness without an old navy to get new clothes, without a pay less to get new sandals, without a Taco Bell to get food, without anything of that nature. And yet God provided for them miraculously. Every need was met for salvation, for freedom, for food. But then they drew near to this need of thirst. And have you ever really been thirsty? I think about the, try to imagine in your head the, the time where you've been the most thirsty in your entire life. For me, I, was, um, I used to play football as a kid. And um, I didn't want to play in the really high league because I wasn't good enough. But I had to lose, I think I had to lose like 10 pounds in two weeks or something to make weight for the lower division so that I could just thump people and I could be one of the biggest people in the league. And so that's, that was what my ideal situation was. But in order to do that, there had to be a non-ideal couple weeks where I dropped all that weight. Um, and I was so thirsty because for a day before, I didn't drink anything and I ran all the time. Very unhealthy, don't, don't do this. Um, don't, let, don't make your kids do this. They, my parents tried to stop me and make me be healthy, but I was, you know, no, I have to play for the, what was it? I had to play for the Falcons. I have to do it. And that was the most important thing to me. Um, but I weighed in. I was right on it. I was supposed to be, I think, one, 110 or something. I was really way smaller back then. But I was, I was right on the dot, and it was, oh, I made it. And then I went out to this water machine. I, I bought a one liter, and I just went, <laughs> And it was done. It, I got it within two or three seconds. It was all, all in my stomach. I was, there was nothing I wanted other than to drink water. And I was super hungry. I was also eating what? Like you'd feed rabbits, shrubs, celeries, whatever you're, whatever you're eating. I wanted to eat. I went to in and out after that too. It was amazing. Um, it was an amazing day that I'm telling you guys about. But um, there was triumph. There was feasting. There was water. But the most important thing that I wanted was to drink. Because thirst, as, as we're going to see I just want to remind you guys that as you're thinking of your thirstiest time, thirst is a need and it's a longing. It's a need and a longing. Um, It's a need that's immediate, it's intense, and it's all-consuming. When you don't have water, you have to get water. You can only live about roughly three days without water. That's why it was a miracle that Jesus was able to fast for 40 days without water. So you have to have it. You can't think. You can't. All it is is a, a need. And it's a true need. When the Israelites ran out of water in the wilderness, they weren't saying, Lord, we don't have any more Slurpees to drink. Lord, we're out of Dom Perignon. Lord, we're out of the most elite, um, you know, smart water that we could ever want. There's, no, we just want water. That was a real need. And they didn't have it for many days. This was the wilderness. This was the test where they felt like, I have a real need. It's all-consuming. It's all I can think about. And it's not being met. It's not only a need, it's a longing. It's something that you're, oh, where is it? Where is the oasis? Where is the spring? Where is the vending machine? <laughs> you know, I, ha- I have to have water. 
when you're thirsty. And uh, there's, there's a few different kinds of longings. I'm borrowing from Dorothy Sayers here, who's a great, a great writer, but um, there's probably more categories that you guys could think of. But there's three I want to just bring up as examples is the longing of the romantic, just to find your soul's true love, your, your soulmate. That's in, you know, represented by stories such as Dante or Orpheus or just things where, where men would even go into the underworld to get, to get their true, true love. That's, that's how powerful that longing is. There's also the pilgrim's longing, symbolized by the Odyssey, you know, like Odysseus. He's got to get home, even if it takes him 10 years, even if he's got to go through everything, he's going to get home. That's the pilgrim's longing. We all have that in our heart as well. Where do I belong? Where's my place? Where's my home? Where do I truly set my roots? That's a powerful longing. Then there's the saint's longing. You might think of Isaiah being drawn into heaven's throne room in Isaiah chapter 6. Or you think of David in Psalm 27, 4 saying, One thing I ask of God, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Oh, he was a saint and he just longed for God to communicate with him. And I hope that that's in your heart. That's the thirst that Jesus talked about with the woman at the well where he said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me and I would give you living water and you'd never thirst ever again. So thirst goes far beyond water. We're going to see in this Old Testament story the thirst that we can have physically. And I hope that, that leads you to ask the question, what is my thirst? What, what wilderness am I in that I thirst so much for something? Is it the ideal relationship? You know, is it beauty? Is it meaning? Is it a place to live? Is it security? What do you think will quench the deepest longings and needs that are in your soul? God is the rock that provides the quenching, satisfying water. Not only for our spirit, but for everything. He's not the God of only the spirits of all flesh, even though He is. He's the God of our emotions. He's the God of our pursuits, the God of our dreams and our hopes, of our families. Everything that we desire, He is the one well of living water. So as we come to this, we want to see Christ in it. We want to see God in this Old Testament picture. And I want us to think about how God is the only quencher of your thirst. The only one. And how we can get it wrong. <laughs> you know, so we're not going to tr- try not to get it wrong, but, but how do we get this living water? How do we drink from Christ who is this rock in the wilderness? Without further ado, I'm going to read the text and then we're going to pray and talk about it a little bit. So they're out, they've just received the manna in the wilderness. They've crossed the Red Sea about 17 to 20 days before this. There's 2 million people, 600,000 men, probably about 2 million people, including a mixed multitude of Egyptians who wanted to join the people of God when they saw his power. So they're all out in the wilderness, 2 million people with nothing to eat and nothing to drink. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandment of the Lord. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? This is God's word. Father, thank you for this account. You've given it to us that we might not desire sin as they did, that they might be examples to us, that we might have faith in you, that we might not be grumblers and testers of you that we might trust you as our spring of living water. 
Show us Jesus in these words, Lord. Show us that you are the one who is among us. Let us focus upon you and receive from you this morning all that we need to quench our thirsts, the deepest longings that we have. Holy Spirit, give us your illumination. I ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, there's an overview of what we're going to talk about today. It is the wilderness, the water, and the one it points to. Okay? So first we're talking about the wilderness, then the water in the wilderness, and then what does that point to? What is the Holy Spirit saying? When he led Moses to write this account, what is the ultimate point? Does he have anything else in view other than two million people wandering around in the dust for 40 years? Yes, he does. What is this story really about? What is the Bible really about? Who knows the, son, who knows the answer? Jesus. Okay, good. Yeah, the answer is Jesus. The, this book is about what? Jesus. Okay, good. That's the, that's the Da Vinci Code. That's, that's, how you understand, that's how you understand the Bible. It's about Jesus. So we're going to see how this wilderness and water, the smitten rock, water comes out. How does that show us who Jesus is? How is it like Jesus? And you might think, what? Like this? No, I don't, I don't really see Jesus in this. This is a story of Moses. I've been taught this since I was four years old. But this is a picture. A picture is worth a thousand words. This is one of my favorite pictures of who Jesus is. This rock that when you strike it, water comes out and it flows back a day, at least a day's journey to, to water the two million people that are camped at Rephidim. Did you guys pick that up? When Moses had to pass on before the people to go to Horeb, Mount Sinai, he had to pass on before the people with the elders. So when he struck the rock, the people weren't at the rock. So much water came out that it flowed all the way down and two million people could drink to their, their satisfaction, that two, that two liter bottle of amazing Aquafina. God's water that came out of the, the rock was probably even better than Aquafina. You know, it was probably amazing. So that was amazing uh, provision, and it shows who God is. It shows the miraculous, satisfying grace of God. Even in our darkest wilderness, even in our thirstiest time, God is a miraculous provider of grace. I don't know if you guys know this, but if, if you picked up a little piece of slate, maybe you were maybe from Marina's floor or something, you pick it up off the ground, out of the, the apartment, if you take a chisel and you go, Tsh! and you hit the slate, it probably won't burst out like Old Faithful. That's very strange. It's very strange. We, we get used to it in the Bible. But when you hit a rock, water doesn't usually shoot out of the rock. Why? Okay, that's, that's amazing. Okay, I just want us to have that in our head, that this is a, actually a miraculous thing, and not to lose our wonder, our wonder at God's word. Because it is truly awesome what God has done for his people. Okay, let's talk about the wilderness. I'm really in a wilderness right now. Oh, the Lord's putting me through a wilderness. We like to do that a lot, you know. Um, but it is true. It can be true. A lot of times we're melodramatic about it. Oh, why doesn't God help me? We start to get the grumbling spirit that the Israelites had. But wildernesses are true. Did you notice in verse 1 it said, they moved by commandment of the Lord by stages into the wilderness. There's going to be stages in your life that get progressively worse and worse and worse by the commandment of the Lord. He was the one that directed them into the situation. The wilderness we're going to see is a place of transition. It's a place of transition, tribulation, and another T word that I forget, testing. Okay, it's a place of transition and tribulation and testing. First of all, the wilderness is a place of transition. They were led there by the commandment of God. In your life, you could be in a job, you could be in a home, you could be in a relationship, you could be somewhere that you have been called to be. You could be in jail, like the man that we prayed for, by the commandment of the Lord, by his sovereign orchestration of your life. You could be in a wilderness. That doesn't mean God isn't among you. You could be in the, the weirdest transitionary period of your life. You could say, I don't have a home, I don't have a family. I don't know. Everyone left me. I don't know what I can rely on. I'm in a wilderness. I don't know where God's taking me, but I know that he's commanded this. But God's in the midst of you. It's a place of transition. 
the Israelites had a new leader. They had a new work. Their work was no longer building pyramids. It was picking up little Krispy Kremes off the ground. But that's, it was new. It was a new job that they had. <laughs> uh, they had a new direction, new difficulties. But they also had new depths of understanding who God was. When they're in their transition, they had to rely on God. And God had to show up every time. When they were bitten by snakes, God had to find a way to cure them of the snakes. When they were hungry, he fed them with manna. When they were thirsty, he sprung open the rock. They relied on him. When they were sweating in the day, about to melt from the Middle Eastern heat, he was the pillar of cloud that was their shade. When they were at night freezing in the desert, he was the pillar of fire that warmed them. So this was a transition but it was a way to know more of who God was, a way that they could never know if they hadn't gone into the wilderness and been totally dependent upon God. That's important to know. When you're transitioning, when you're in a wilderness, you're going to have new depths of understanding who God is. The next thing about the wilderness is it is a place of tribulation. I think about a a lot of the tribulations and distresses that came upon the people. I listed a few of them. They had discomfort. Maybe this is your life right now. Try to put yourself in the scriptures. Let God, let God speak to you on this. Where is the area of your life that's a, that's a wilderness? Is it your relationships? Is it your job? Is it your marriage? Is it your kids? I don't, I don't know what it is. But let him speak. It's an area of discomfort, of delay. Why is this not happening yet? I've been waiting so long. Why are we not in the promised land? It's been 17 days already, God. Well, it's going to be a few more days, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. Be 40 years. Um, they get attacked later on in verse 8 in the same place. They get attacked by the Amalekites. You might feel like the enemy's coming at you. You feel like everything's going wrong. People are your enemy. You're, there's injustice. There's people taking things away from you in this wilderness. Ah, oh, what? You know, it's a place of attack. It's a place of need, thirst, and hunger. A place of anger, not only against your leaders, those in charge of you. Moses, Aaron, why'd you bring us out here to die? We're, my favorite little thing that they say, the Israelites are always complaining against Moses and Aaron and say, Moses, why did you bring us out here? You just wanted to kill us. Why did, you, why did you even bring us out of slavery? It was better when we were chained up and getting whipped all day by the, by the Egyptians. But my favorite one they say was, um, were there not enough graves in Egypt that you bring us out here to die? <laughs> it's like, no, there was plenty of graves if we wanted to just die back in Egypt. But they get angry at their leaders, at the ones in authority over them, and at God. Remember Moses said, why are, you, why are you quarreling with me? Your quarrel's with God. I can't give you water. I can't give you food. I couldn't have struck down the firstborn of Egypt. I couldn't have turned the Nile into blood. You're quarreling against God. Right? And so there's anger in this wilderness. You might have anger against people in authority or against God himself. That doesn't mean it's right, but it's, it's an element of the wilderness. There's suffering in your wilderness. The Israelites endured judgments, they endured plagues, they endured serpents, they endured God's discipline upon them. They were suffering. There was also a nostalgia. This, is, this may be one of the worst parts of the wilderness. Oh, there were persimmon trees in Egypt. Oh, there was, there was apple pie back there. Oh, there was, there was chicken that was fried and it tasted so good and we used to have that, and we used to have the sandals that were brand new on our, like new Birkenstocks on our feet, you know, and they would, they would just whine about it. It was so much better when we were slaves. Maybe you have that, maybe you think, oh, my old job was so much better. <laughs> my old city was so much better. My old family was so much better. I mean, some of that's legit. But the nostalgia comes in, and you just say, oh, why did God take me out in this wilderness? <laughs> that's terrible. That, that is true suffering. When you think the grass is greener on the past side, you're like, oh, I'm never even getting back there. That's where the grass is the greenest, and I can't go back. Okay. You see the tribulation in the wilderness. There's also the wilderness as a place of testing. And it's a place where your heart is tested. God said in Deuteronomy, I let you hunger so that you would know that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's a test. Where is your focus? Is it on the obstacles around you? God, why is there sand and choking dust and no water and there's no leeks and onions and 
we're lost and we're delayed. Like the focus is all outward. This doesn't look like the promised land, God. And Moses could have said, it's not the promised land. This is the desert. <laughs> God, look, why, this doesn't look like Santa Barbara to me. No, son, this is Death Valley. You, know? you came here to look at it because you thought it was a nice national park. For some reason you think it's Santa Barbara. It's not. It's, do you see this? They're looking all outward at the obstacles. Everything that's against them. Everything that's wrong. Or, on the flip side, if you pass this test, you could be like Joshua, you could be like Caleb, you could be like Moses. They focused upon God in their midst. There was a pillar of cloud and fire that was the Shekinah glory of God. At the end of this section they say, is the Lord among us or not? Moses could go, Yeah, well, he is. Did you guys think about that? Did, did that? Was that important to you? God is not only in the midst of this room, he's in your heart by the Holy Spirit. You, are, you have everything that Israel had. If they were to dwell upon it, God in their midst. In the past, he'd been faithful. In the past, he'd chosen them, he'd redeemed them. He had saved them from Egypt. In the present, he was supplying food and water. He was near to them. He was giving them power over their enemies as they defeat Amalek in the next section. But he was right there. And in the future, God being among you means you are going to inherit everything that he promised. This isn't the promised land, but it will come. So often, we are upset because our expectations are completely wrong. Why isn't this the promised land? Because it's not the promised land. But I expected it to be. It's not. Why isn't this job the promised land? Because it's not. Why isn't this achievement the promised land? Because it's not. Why isn't this family the promised land? Because it's not. Why isn't this new church the promised land? Because it's not. It's not. We expect our circumstances to be for us and God to be against us. Whoosh. Expect your circumstances to be against you, and God to be for you. This world is against you. It's run by the enemy. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John chapter 5. Our expectations are out of whack. And when we expect wrong, we can't pass this test, because we will not look at the Lord among us. We will look at everything that's against us. And that's what the Israelites looked at. And all they could do was grumble and tempt God and say, Lord, if you were really among us, this wouldn't happen. And I think what's, what's key to realize is they weren't asking, really, is the Lord among us? Does the Lord exist? They weren't asking, is there really a God? Did this universe unfold by chance? Is our God a real God? Is he really among us here? Is that cloud really him or just an illusion that Moses is putting on with a smoke machine and laser light show. That wasn't what they were asking. They were saying, is God among us for our good? Is God for us? Is God among us to do us good? Well, the question will be answered by the water. The question will not be answered by micromanaging and analyzing the wilderness. Is God for me? I don't think so. Look at this wilderness. The question will not be answered by looking at the wilderness. It will be answered by going to the water. The next section is the water. God said to Mo Moses, by the way, had the right response. You have a few choices in the wilderness. How will you respond? The right one is to cry out for water. That's the fifth choice. That's what Moses did. He said, God, I can't get water. I'm, please give me what I really need. Quench my thirst. There's four wrong choices. You can either medicate the problem. I hate this wilderness. Let's do more hobbies. Let's do more entertainment. Let's watch more Netflix. Let's, take, let's drink alcohol. Let's blind it. Let's, let's abuse substances. Let's medicate this away. Oh, let's get really into our careers, and then we'll be good. Then we'll, then we'll have an amazing, purposeful life, and this wilderness will turn into the promised land. We'll medicate. That's a wrong choice. 
Or you can grumble, like we said. Why am I in a wilderness? Why does this not work? Where is God? Why isn't God good to me? Or you can despair. <sighs> I'm never getting out of this wilderness. Can you believe, can you believe this? Of course. <laughs> Cynicism comes in. You just bail. Say, this can't be fixed. I'm going to bail on my commitments. I'm going to bail on where I've been put. I'm going to despair. I'm going to give up. Or you can lie to yourself. The sun will come out tomorrow. Really, probably the wilderness is only about six more hours journey. Just go one more day. Come on. It's, it's fine. You can lie to yourself. Or again, you can cry out to God for water. That's what Moses did. The water comes next. He passes ahead. He strikes the rock. And the water comes out. Do you know that the water came to sinners? It didn't come to people that really deserved the water. It didn't come to people that said, oh, we're really thirsty, but we remember everything that God did. God's awesome. Remember when he just humiliated the Egyptian gods? I know. Remember when he rained the bread? We've never seen that. I'm sure he's going to bring us water. Oh, we love him so much. They didn't say that. <laughs> you guys read the story. They didn't say it. They didn't deserve the provision, but it came to him anyway. You, feel like, you might feel like, oh, man, I've been messing up. I've been failing. I deserve to be in this wilderness. God's not going to do anything for me. God's not going to help me out, but he will. The water will come to sinners. Jesus said, I didn't come to save those who think that they're already righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. You can have the water if you just are thirsty for it. The only requirement's thirst. It really is. Next, the water came from God. God said to Moses, I will stand on the rock. The rock that Moses struck, a few chapters later would be where God, he sat there in fire and he gave the law. That hadn't happened yet. He's going to sit there in grace and give water. You guys ever seen that before? It's the same mountain. But he says, I'm going to stand on the rock, so when you hit the rock, water is going to come out. It wasn't that they just uncovered an artesian spring. Oh, luck of the draw. Psh, wow, amazing. Moses, you're the luckiest guy that ever lived. That wasn't why water came out. The water came from God. It didn't come from Moses' works or the fact that he had a metal detector or something and he found the perfect place. It came from God. The water came through judgment. And this is the point that I want to spend a little bit of time on. This is why the rock is Christ. 1 Corinthians 10.3 Okay. This is important to see. There's a preposition here in verse 6. God said, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb. He said, Take the rod in your hand and smash the rock. Okay. If I have a rod and I am going to strike this chair and Alex will give me water, I'm going to strike this chair. Right? Can I hit this chair without hitting Alex? I can't do it. Moses struck God. And he did it not by himself. He, he did it with all the elders of Israel. The elders meant this is Israel doing this to God as one. When Elijah uh, faced off against the false prophets on Mount Carmel of Asherah, of Asherah and, and Baal, it said all Israel saw it. That didn't mean that all seven million people that lived in the land of Israel were there. It meant that the elders of Israel were there. They represented all the clans, all the tribes. So when God said to Moses, hey Moses, you and the elders go to the rock. I will stand on the rock and you hit me. He meant all of Israel is striking me. And when you strike me, I'm going to give you life instead. What? It's amazing. There was a total rift in the relationship between Israel and God. There was anger there. There was wrath. Israel was mad at God. God and His holiness would be offended at the unbelief and grumbling and quarreling of Israel. So where does that anger go? It went into God. You would think, okay, there's a king. I've offended him. 
He's got a rod in his hand. Well, he'll probably hit me with that rod. He should. He's the king. You're the rebel. He should hit you. But instead, God puts the rod in Moses' hand. And he says, you hit me. And I'll give you the water. That's what God says to us. The water comes to you through judgment. Because Jesus Christ, God, the rock, went on the cross and his side was pierced with a spear and out of his side flowed blood and water. John 19.34 He is the rock that was pierced. He is God that was struck by Israel. He is the rock. And more than just physical water flowed from Christ. An infinite supply of forgiving grace flowed from his side. For us. The water comes not because you impress God. Not because you go to church. Not because you're a nice person. Not because you know a lot of facts about theology. The water of God's forgiveness and adoption and choice and salvation, it comes to you because the rock was struck once 2,000 years ago. He did it. You don't have to do anything but receive it. The Israelites didn't have to do anything but put their little leather water skin in the spring and start drinking it. It flowed to them. Moses was the one that walked up and struck the rock. They just sat in camp, and then the water rushed down like an ever-flowing stream, the righteousness of God, and they drank of it. The water came to them through the judgment of God, judgment that should have fallen on them, but instead fell on the rock, God himself. Does that make sense to you guys? What kind of God is that? When I preached the sermon the first time, I got I to just give you my outline because I have some, some preacher, vain, stupid pride about it. I thought it was good. It was that first the God tested the people, then the people tested God, then the people struck God, and then God saved the people. That's what happened. We serve a God that when you strike him, when you rebel against him, he says, how can I, how can I give you something good? I hate you, God. I love you. That's the God that we serve. Here's water. That's amazing. He supplied their needs. He, he quenched their thirst. When all they had for him was resentment. All they had for him was hate. What he had for them was forgiveness and grace. I want to be like that. I want to be a fountain the way that God is. A fountain that will serve those around me. And we'll see that we, we are called to be that. A few other things about this water. It came out abundantly, like I already said. It flowed miles back to where the people were. God's not just giving you a trickle. <laughs> if you need your thirst quenched, he's not like, here's a trickle. You stumble on for a few more days. No. If that's what you want, that's what you'll get. If that's all you think you can get, that's what you'll get. But if you say, no, God's gracious and he's merciful, I can have all I need. My heart can become a spring of living water. You'll get that. You'll be able to be at peace no matter what wilderness you're walking through. You'll be able to be full no matter how empty your circumstances are. It's abundant. Jesus didn't come. He came that you could have life and life abundantly. Okay. The next one is that water came to satisfy thirst. They all drank. And the water will come to the whole world. A couple scriptures. I'll go through these quick. The water will come to the whole world. Zechariah 14.8, on that day, which is the last day, which we're living in now, <laughs> because the Messiah has come. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. Ezekiel 47.1, then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple toward the east. Okay. Ezekiel sees this river pouring out of the temple of God. And every thousand cubits, it gets a little bit deeper. First it was ankle deep. Then it was knee deep. Then it was waist deep. Then it was neck deep. which just is increasing. And everywhere the, the river went, the salt water was turned to fresh, and the bogs were turned into farmland, and there was a renewal that happened. This is a spiritual picture that Ezekiel is giving of the restoration of worship the restoration of God's people. The water will come to the whole world, not just to where the temple is, but it will flow out all the way to the eastern sea, all, to all nations. All nations will drink 
of God's grace. See that little water equals grace. Okay, maybe that will help. Water equals grace. Water equals favor from God. Mercy, blessing, quenching of your spiritual thirst. Okay. Lastly, my favorite one, Revelation 22. This is the end of the story. What's the story about? Okay, yeah. Okay, this is how the story about Jesus ends. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. All people will drink of this water. All people are, maybe you today, are in some kind of wilderness, and the water's for you. Lastly, the one that it points to, Jesus Christ. <laughs> we praise the rock and the water which was once struck so that we could, live, we, we could drink forever. Do you see how this points to Jesus? I've already read these scriptures. <laughs> no, need, no need to read them again. It's Christ. He's the one that when he's struck, grace comes out. He's the one. It's, it's such an amazing picture of who God is. Okay, how do I get this living water? This is how I'll conclude. That's, what, that's the question that the woman asked Jesus. Okay, you have this living water to give me? Great. How do I get it? <laughs> well, there's a few rules to go through here. Speak, don't smite. Ask and receive. Believe and unblock. Go to te well each day. The, and then flow outward. The first one would be speak, don't smite. There's one more story where the rock comes into play. There's another location near Kadesh, which is another stop along their wilderness journey. There's another place that Moses named Meribah, just like this place. It was another place where the Israelites thirsted about 40 years later. The same thing happened. Ever get to the same wilderness another time? Okay, it happens, right? We, we're going to deal, Craig said last week, we're going to deal with these tests until we pass the test. If you fail the test, Jesus will forgive you. You try again. Father's going to give you the test again because <laughs> he wants you to pass the test. You know, that's the difference between a test and attempt. When I give someone a test, I want them to pass the test. When I tempt someone, I want them to fail the test. God only tests. Okay? So they come back to this test and they got it completely right. No. <laughs> Wrong. They got it even worse. Even Moses got it wrong the second time. Has that ever happened to you? I do worse the second time. Why do I do that? Good thing I have a God that forgives me. And I, you know, try again. So what happened was, um, in the speak, don't smite section, if we have those scriptures to put up, the first time they needed water, the rock had to be struck. The second time, he was to speak to the rock. God said, take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron and your brother, and tell the rock to yield water. In, in Hebrew, speak to the rock or commune with the rock. Dabar is, is the word. Just, just ask for water. It's already been struck. You can ask for it, and it'll come out. And Moses said, all right, all right God, I know how to do it. Okay, I know how to do it, God. Okay, all you rebels, shall we bring water out of this rock? Bam, bam. Uh, that was a sin. <laughs> Moses chose the method and the ritual. I'm going to meet my needs through religious ritual. I know how to do this stuff. I did it before. It worked before. I'm going to do it again. Well, God didn't say that. You know why? Because it ruined the picture of Jesus. Every time you need forgiveness, Jesus doesn't have to die again. You just speak. I need water. I failed. I'm, my life isn't going so well, Jesus. I need the Holy Spirit. I need him to, to renew me, and I need strength. Okay, just ask. Commune with the rock. Spend time in prayer. Speak, don't smite. Right? That's the lesson. Moses was not allowed to go in the promised land because he so turned the image of Christ through this. It dishonored Christ. So we're not going to hammer God into blessing us. Right? We're going to speak to him in a loving relationship. You're never going to hammer God into doing the thing that you think that he should do because he's already done more than you could ever have asked him to do. He's better than you think he is. 
So in our relationship with him, we can receive the water we need. The next thing about this, how to get it, is we ask and receive the water. Go into John chapter 4. Jesus said to the woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This woman was a sinner. The woman that Jesus is talking to in this situation, she'd been married and divorced four times and she was living with a man that was not her husband. Or no, five times. And she was living with another man that was not her husband. And Jesus said, if, if you would have known who I was, you would have just asked and I would have given you living water. But Jesus, she's not a good person. That's not what he said. He said, ask and you will receive the living water because God is good and God is gracious, not us. Okay. Jesus said, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, this physical water. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The only requirements are a deep thirst and a simple request. Are you at that point in the wilderness? God, I'm done. I'm just done. I'm even done. I don't even have the spit in my mouth to argue with you anymore. I'm that thirsty. You notice the Israelites, they still had a lot of spit in their mouths that they could, that they could complain against Moses and against God. Oh, they still had a lot of phlegm and spit that they could throw at Moses. But there comes a point where you're so thirsty that you just go, God. And he's like, yeah, okay, I was waiting. That's it. Here you go. You're done? Okay. <laughs> it's like a kid throwing a tantrum. It's like, okay, all right, now you can have it. <laughs> so we ask and we receive. Why is it so easy? Well, because the rock has already been struck and the fountain is already flowing. It's always flowing. That rock probably stopped flowing at some point. The grace of Jesus never stops flowing. The next thing is believe and unblock. We'll go quick. We've got maybe five more minutes here. Believe and unblock. Okay. Compare. This is, this is the scripture that I want to show. There was a feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, during Jesus' day. And the priest would pour gallons of water on the altar, and it would flow down the steps of the temple. And they would, they would say, this is what happened to our fathers in the wilderness. God quenched our thirst. God will bring us into the promised land one day. And yet they would still do the ceremony. They were in the promised land. They would still do the ceremony. They still had the thirst. They would still reenact the ceremony to remember what God did, but also I think to say we still have this thirst. And it said on the last day of the feast when the priest would pour this out down the steps, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who had believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay. In John, glorified means crucified. That was where Jesus' greatest glory was seen on the cross where he satisfied the perfect holiness of God by taking the judgment of sin, and he showed the perfect love of God by extending mercy. Jesus, when he was glorified, the Spirit could be poured out. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter says, this Jesus whom you crucified has risen to heaven, and he has poured out this blessing that you see today. He has poured out the Holy Spirit like a fountain of living waters from the side of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus stood next to the water rushing down the steps, he said, it's me, it's not the rock in the wilderness. Come to me and drink. And we can. So that is the fountain. Believe that that's the fountain and unblock it in your heart. It's flowing, it's trying to flow. You're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in you. He's, he's full, his fullness is in you. Unblock it. Unlock the doors of the rooms in your heart. Let him gush into all those rooms. Let him take you over completely. Let them stream in you in an ever-deepening river. What is blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit? What is blocking Christ in your life? Is it riches? Is it worldly ambitions? Is it sins? Unblock that. Just all you have to do. You're not trying to gain anything from God. You unblock the fountain and it flows. So ask the Spirit, what's interfering, Holy Spirit? I want to unblock that fountain. 
Next, go to the well each day. Just drink every day. You have to drink every day or you're going to get really thirsty. You have to meditate on Scripture each day. You have to pray each day. Not because God is, wow, what an amazing Christian, but because you need to drink from God. You need it. God doesn't need it. You need it. Go to the well each day. And lastly, flow outward. If you're a rock like Jesus, a fountain of living waters filled with the same spirit that Jesus had, you by definition need to flow out. Because that's what a fountain does, or else it's a broken fountain. So you, you flow. If you only ever receive, that's not the picture of a Christian in the New Covenant. Isn't it amazing? The very thing that Jesus is, the smitten rock that flows out to give life to others, that's what you are. You are called to also be a smitten, a wounded rock that can give grace to other people. Is, has your, have you been smitten? Have you been wounded? Has your pride been taken down so that you can flow out? Have you allowed the Lord to strike you? Have you allowed Him to correct you? Have you allowed Him to wound you? To bring you to a humble place where you can flow? If there's no hole in your rock, there's no water coming out of your rock. I feel like that could be a hard word, but it's a hard prayer to pray. Lord, whatever it takes, I want to become a fountain of living waters. Not for myself only. For the people at my job. For the people in my wilderness. Instead of complaining about them, I want to be the rock that gives them water. Could that be a miracle? Is that something you can receive? Yes. Is that so far beyond the pale? No. He said, whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Not whatever pastor or priest or evangelist believes in me. Whoever believes in me, he will not just be full of the living waters, he will be flowing with living waters. The Holy Spirit. That's the picture. Christ was the rock struck for us. Christ lives in us by the Spirit to make us life givers as well. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the picture of Jesus. I pray that you would create in us a spring of living water. I pray that whatever wilderness we're going into, whatever thirsts are tormenting us, that we would realize we have the waters we need to quench that thirst. Thank you that you give it by pure grace. Thank you that you give it even when we don't deserve it. Thank you that the fountain's always open. Thank you that today is a new day and your mercies are fresh. And thank you, Lord, that when we were angry at you and when we struck you, you gave us life in return. We worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen.